Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we try to cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. And I'm Jay McKenzie. Matt Taibbi and Elon Musk have a nasty public breakup after Taibbi gets inaccurate information in the Twitter files. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. throws his hat into the ring to challenge Joe Biden for the Democratic presidential nomination. And Texas Governor Greg Abbott is attempting to do something governors rarely do in Texas. He's trying to pardon a murderer. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and a review on the app that you're listening on. Be sure to subscribe at didnothingwrongpod.com to get our content straight into your inbox. All of our work is free, but we're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that ensure that we can keep doing this important work. Thank you. Today, we're going to start with a discussion about the Twitter files and the meticulous fact checking and truth to power, which was carried out thanks to the benevolence of Elon Musk and the hard hitting investigative journalism of Matt Taibbi. (laughs) Uh, Are we really? That's what we're doing, right? Okay. Yes, yes. It's very important to... Uh, good try, good uh, try, good that's, try. That's as, that's as much as I could, yeah, I couldn't make it any longer. I couldn't, I had to stop. All right. Uh, I had like three more pages of this. Okay. Oh, jeez. Um, no, no, no. No one wants to listen to that. Nope. Um, Not even Elon okay. anymore. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's uh, RIP, pour one out for mm-hmm. that, that bromance. Yes, yeah, so actually... Today, we're going to talk about the <laughs> the lover's quarrel between Matt Taibbi and Elon Musk that went down starting last weekend. It happened after Mehdi Hassan embarrassed Matt Taibbi in an interview on MSNBC. And right around the same time, Elon Musk picked a fight with Substack, which is the place where Taibbi makes all of his money from subscriptions. Right, right. So Musk is mad at Substack because they're rolling out their own Twitter clone soon, and that could hurt Twitter's bottom line. And after Substack announced this, Twitter, apparently without any warning, removed Substack's API access, which means that users could no longer embed tweets in their posts on Substack. Most people who use Substack embed tweets. It's part of the appeal, and it's definitely a hassle for people to lose this feature. Then Twitter started throttling links to Substack on Twitter. At one point, you couldn't like or reply to these tweets, and anyone who clicked on a link to Substack got an unsafe link warning from Twitter. Musk claims this is being done because Substack is attempting to steal Twitter's user data, but he has kind of a history of being petty and finding excuses for his actions later. And at the same time all of this was going on, Matt Taibbi did his interview with Mehdi Hassan on MSNBC where he discussed the Twitter files, the selectively leaked internal data and discussions from Twitter that were given to a few people handpicked by Elon Musk to report on the information. The interview did not go well for Taibbi. Hassan pointed out several errors in Taibbi's reporting. We're talking basic fundamental details that would have been picked up by a decent editor. Here's a clip from that interview. You talk a lot about the election integrity project in the Twitter files, which Stanford and the University of Washington founded to monitor attacks on our elections. Um, And you say some stuff about them that a lot of your critics say is not true, and that affects your credibility. You said the EIP was founded in response to the government dropping its proposal for a disinformation government. Well, there you are. We're quoting you on screen. It wasn't. It was formed two years earlier. Uh, you suggest it was government funded, even though during the 20 election, 2020 election that you're covering, it wasn't. Uh, you say they labeled 22 million tweets as misinformation in the run up to the 2020 vote. They didn't. Uh, they got they flagged 3000 election misinformation tweets for labeling. So you were only 21 million nine hundred ninety seven thousand off. And you also um, claim the EIP was. Let me finish the question. You can come back in. You also claim the EIP was partnered with the government cybersecurity and infrastructure agency, CISA, to censor Twitter. But you mix up CISA, CISA, a homeland security agency, with the Center for Internet Security, the CIS, which is a nonprofit. In fact, you added an A to CIS. I think people can see it there uh, in brackets uh, to make that false claim. It's just error after error, Matt, on just this one That's topic. Error. But, the other, but the other ones aren't. The, the, no, no, the, the, tw- 
22, 22 million, million number came from their own report. Yeah, where did it, it came from a report in March. <laughs> Do you know what the 22 million number is, Matt? Can you tell me? Because we checked. 22 million is the number of tweets about election misinformation that were just that they just mapped. How many tweets were they? The ones they actually flagged to Twitter before the election. 22 million came after the election. It wasn't in the run-up. They flagged 3,000. So you were off by 21 million 997,000. They, 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 they said a lot of things. I I, I I stand by my story. You stand by what story? You stand by 22 million were flagged in the run-up to the election, even though that number came in March 2021, which was after the election. You say, this is what you say, that it would, the EIP was created after the public uproar paused the disinformation board. That's wrong. You need to correct that as well, don't you? After the... Uh that's what no, your words. You say to quote you. After public uproar paused the Orwellian disinformation governance board, Stanford created the EIP. That's wrong. Well, uh, that's what they say. I, I, I. Uh, my, well, you my could check. That you could check. You don't need sources, Matt. You could check the EIP website. It says it was created in 2020. Well, that's the date that I just said. And the, the disinformation board was 2022. Okay. All right. Well, then that is an error. But Matt Taibbi doesn't need an editor because he's on Substack, which doesn't require one. Mike Masnick wrote about this interview over at TechDirt in an article entitled Mehdi Hassan Dismantles the Entire Foundation of the Twitter Files as Matt Taibbi Stumbles to Defend It. I'll read from it now. So here's the deal. If you think the Twitter files are still something legit or telling or powerful, Watch this 30-minute interview that Mehdi Hassan did with Matt Taibbi at Taibbi's own demand. Hassan came prepared with facts, lots of them, many of which debunked the core foundation on which Taibbi and his many fans have built the narrative regarding the Twitter files. We've debunked many of Matt's errors over the past few months, and a few of the errors we've called out, though not nearly all, as there are so, so many, show up in Hassan's interview, while Taibi shrugs, sighs, and makes it clear that he's totally out of his depth when confronted with facts. Since the interview, Taibi has been scrambling to claim that the errors Hassan called out are small side issues, but they're not. They're literally the core pieces on which he's built the nonsense framing that Stanford, the University of Washington, some nonprofits, the government, and social media have formed an, quote, industrial censorship complex, unquote, to stifle the speech of Americans. The errors that Hassan highlights matter a lot. A key one of Taibbi's claims is that the Election Integrity Partnership flagged 22 million tweets for Twitter to take down in partnership with the government. This is flat out wrong. The EIP, which was focused on studying election interference, flagged less than 3,000 tweets for Twitter to review, 2,890 to be exact. And they were quite clear in the report on how all this worked. EIP was an academic project to track election interference information and how it flowed across social media. The 22 million figure shows up in the report, but it was just a count of how many tweets they tracked and trying to follow how this information spread, not seeking to remove it. And the vast majority of these tweets weren't even related to the ones they did explicitly create tickets on. They said in total, our incident related tweet data included 5,888,771 tweets and retweets from ticket status IDs directly, over a million tweets and retweets collected first from ticket URLs, and nearly 15 million from keyword searches for a total of just under 22 million tweets. I'm, I'm rounding there because you don't need all the numbers. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the article also adds tracking how information spreads is um, not a problem now, is it? Is Taibi really claiming that academics shouldn't track the flow of information? There's a lot more in this Tech Dirt article. You should really go read it. We're going to link to it into the show notes. So rather than try to read through the entire thing, I'm going to share a few more examples. Taibi falsely assumed someone at Twitter had written a typo and thus incorrectly assumed that Twitter was working with the government agency CISA based on a typo that wasn't actually a typo because the Twitter employee wrote CIS, which is a nonprofit that really exists and worked with the Election Integrity Project, or EIP, which was itself partnered with Twitter. Taibbi admitted this was a mistake, but later defended the mistake on Twitter anyway. 
Taibbi was also wrong about when the EIP was founded. It was 2020, not 2022. Mehdi Hassan also pointed out that Taibbi left out context in his very first Twitter files, such as the Biden campaign, which, as you remember, was not part of the government at the time, requesting, requesting Twitter take down specific tweets about Hunter Biden. Now, what was the missing context? These were nude pictures of Hunter Biden, which were posted online without his consent. So this was revenge porn. And Taibbi claimed that the context there was irrelevant. I think it was relevant. I think James Woods, which one of his tweets was uh, in that tweet that Taibbi put out in the Twitter files. I think James Woods posting a dick pic of Hunter Biden (laughs) is relevant to the context of the discussion. I think it's fair for the Biden campaign to request that be taken down. Mm -hmm. And they they didn't even order it or demand it. They request it. Um, But that was apparently too much for Matt Taibbi. But Taibbi posted the Twitter files directly onto Twitter in threads, and it was painfully obvious from day one that he didn't have an editor, even though he really, really needed one. Oh, yeah. It, it, the whole thing was odd. It it was kind of the, the thread popped up out of nowhere, and he was posting in random increments. At first, they were really quick succession of tweets and clearly he had at least started to write out the thread before he started it but at some point into the thread it started taking longer and longer for each tweet to go out Mm -hmm. um so yeah he he really could have used an editor beforehand but it all felt rushed it's all felt really rushed and the conclusions don't really match the claims but the these posts, even the inaccurate ones, have stayed up anyway because they serve their purpose. Mm-hmm. Jim Jordan and the House GOP got to weaponize the information. Uh, Elon Musk was happy with Taibbi and his quote-unquote reporting until Matt fell even slightly out of line. Then Musk unfollowed Taibbi and posted their private messages on Twitter and thus, in a way, creating a whole new episode of the Twitter files. <laughs> Taibbi also posted the original Twitter files directly to Twitter because Elon Musk told him he had to if he wanted the data to write them from Twitter. Taibbi also said that he agreed to tell anyone who asked that he got the Twitter data from, quote, sources at Twitter. All indications are that the so-called, quote, sources at Twitter (laughs) and Taibbi worked very closely on this one. Yes, uh, sources at Twitter, which just so happened to appear after Elon Musk spent $44 billion to purchase the platform. And oh, by the way, Taibbi and Musk have had multiple conversations since he purchased the platform. Taibbi also admitted they talked about the Twitter files at least once in an interview he did with Russell Brand Hmm. last December. Just the other day, Musk tweeted and then deleted their private communications on Signal, which, as we know, is an encrypted app that allows you to delete messages on a timer or at will. Mm-hmm. Convenient. If you're looking to hide the PR work you're doing for the world's formerly richest man. I did notice that you managed to archive a copy of Musk's deleted tweets. That was really nice of you to keep a copy for him since he looked like he deleted those tweets pretty quickly. Yeah, it was a matter of minutes and actually was kind of difficult to find it because I noticed someone tried to archive it, but the tweet had already been deleted. And the Google keeps a cache, which is Mm. kind of like a temporary archive. And that was also gone. It didn't show the the tweet in question. But I had to, I essentially found a cache of someone else's tweet. I think it was Michael Schellenberger's who Musk had replied to. And that cache still existed and was out there and i was able to archive that so yeah just you know just you drop this king and uh try to make sure (laughs) he could have a copy of that conveniently he happened to unfollow michael schellenberger as well right afterwards so wow elon's just Uh, having a day over there it just doesn't take much does it no it just no he's now he's now fallen out with all of the hand-picked so-called journalist, Mm -hmm. including Barry Weiss and Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi. So there may have been one other guy. I don't even remember his name. Shows you how much I I care about the Twitter files. Lee Fang co-authored one of those articles with him, too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But whatever. Yeah. Well, he was writing uh, stuff in 2016 with Glenn Greenwald over at The Intercept, downplaying everything Russia was doing. So I'm not going to consider him the most credible source not either. At all. Maybe he can get Mark Ames to write the next incarnation of the Twitter files. God. So I know somebody put up a thread, and it may have been Mehdi Hassan who did a, who did a poll on Twitter and asked, now that Matt Taibbi has, has quit the oh, Twitter God. files, who, <laughs> who's he going to get next? And... Second second place in the poll was was Poso was Jack Posobiec and number one, <laughs> but <laughs> far and away the most likely contender appears to be Cat Turd too. So, <laughs> well, you know Elon's going to have to ask him nice, but that maybe that's why he's been so solicitous of Cat Turd too ever since <laughs> he and he, he knew was going to come to this. He wants to stay on Cat Turd's good side because <laughs> you know. <laughs> Got to stay right with Catcher. Uh, that's right. It's important. Oh, God. The whole thing is just extremely annoying. Taibbi went in front of Congress and refused to tell them who his source for the Twitter files was. Republicans feigned outrage at Democrats asking Taibbi who his source was. How dare they question a journalist about his sources? But Musk has repeatedly hyped the Twitter files on Twitter, as we've all seen. Mm -hmm. He has, at last count, 134 million followers. Just the fact that he retweeted this stuff, quote tweeted it, replied to it, it meant it was going to get all sorts of traction, as intended. Mm -hmm. It it fits the right-wing narratives about the quote-unquote deep state perfectly. It's red meat for Fox News and all the MAGA influencers. And Musk clearly selectively leaked the data that would be most beneficial to Republicans and most damaging to Democrats. And this is a guy who, again, before the last midterms, told everyone to go vote Republican. And the summer before that election, the midterm elections, Musk was at a donor retreat with Kevin McCarthy and lots of other bigwigs in the Republican Party. So... Even though the New York Times can't figure out this guy's politics, I think we know. We do I... have some kind of an idea somehow. It's it's right here coming to us. Just mm-hmm. he might be a little bit on the right wing side. Just a yeah. little bit. Yeah. And Taibi claimed in his interview with my with Mehdi Hassan that part of the scandal was the fact that the Biden campaign could get Twitter to take down some tweets, but a normal person couldn't just reach out to Twitter and get stuff taken down. Normal people can't just demand things at Twitter. That'd be crazy. Meanwhile, here's Taibbi and Musk chatting back and forth about optics on Signal. <laughs> normal people. Yeah. Uh, I think... <laughs> I think even if we're charitable here, common people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, with his, I think the what I read this week is at a minimum based on Taibbi's number of subscribers, he's pulling in 500k a year now off of Substack. So he's he's doing fine. Yeah, he's doing not not so not so normal there. No, no, that's a that's a whole different tax bracket. Yeah, pretty impressive. But yeah. I think I think even if we're charitable here and say that Taibi is still a journalist, which fine, anyone can call themselves a journalist. I can call myself the Easter Bunny and <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Okay, fine. Matt Taibi is still a journalist. Fine. But even so, whatever Taibi was doing with the Twitter files, it just simply wasn't journalism. Now the whole thing appears to be dead, and Musk is actively censoring searches for the Twitter files posted by Matt Taibbi, at least at the time of this recording. If you search for tweets by Taibbi about the Twitter files, you get no results. Yeah, and the whole thing went up in flames, but Taibbi is making bank over at Substack with his tens of thousands of paying subscribers, and I think he'll be okay. Yeah, just hope it was worth it. So speaking of guys who frequently repeat pro-Kremlin talking points, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has announced his intention to run against Joe Biden in the Democratic primary for the office of presidency in 2024. Because apparently having one anti-vax left-wing candidate, Marianne Williamson, wasn't enough. Here comes one more, and oh, by the way, he's being cheered on by Steve Bannon. We're remaking politics right now in this country. Right. Right. Different alliances and different coalitions. So I think, like I said, Robert F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy could jump into the Republican primary for president and only DeSantis and Trump, I think, would do better. Like I said, you could add up Nikki Haley and everybody else. 
Uh, now, I know he won't do that, but my point is, if you had said that a couple of years ago, people would say, Steve, you're a nutcase, right? But now he's got such a on our audience, he's got a massive following. I mean, I think we sold 750,000 copies of the book, right? That's Just amazing. in the war room. He sold over a million and a half copies of the book, right? Or almost a million seven five now, I think. Yeah. It's incredible. People love this guy. Here's Sama Kular writing for Salon. Former chief Trump strategist Steve Bannon spent, quote, months, unquote, encouraging anti-vaxxer Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to run against President Joe Biden in the 2024 election, according to a report from CBS News. People familiar with the matter told the outlet that Bannon hoped Kennedy could serve as a, quote, useful chaos agent, unquote, in the election while also spreading, quote, anti-vaccine sentiment around the country, unquote, according to CBS News' uh, Robert Costa. Kennedy, a nephew of President John F. Kennedy and son of the murdered Robert F. Kennedy, filed paperwork with the Federal Election Commission on Wednesday to run as a Democrat in the upcoming election. The story adds, Kennedy has been accused of playing a leading role in spreading digital misinformation about COVID vaccines by the Center for Countering Digital Hate. He also issued an apology last year after saying that Americans hesitant to vaccines had it, quote, worse than Anne Frank. Unquote. Kennedy had long been involved in the anti-vaccine movement. His charity, Children's Health Defense, flourished during the pandemic, with revenues more than doubling in 2020 to $6.8 million, according to filings made with charity regulators obtained by CBS News. He also released a book in 2021 titled The Real Anthony Fauci, in which he accused the country's top infectious disease doctor of committing quote, a historic coup d'etat against Western democracy, unquote. He has also taken his vaccine conspiracy theories to Fox News, telling Tucker Carlson, quote, we have to love our freedom more than we fear a germ, unquote. <laughs> God. <laughs> Kennedy also made an appearance at a rally against vaccine mandates in Washington, D.C., during which he said, quote, the minute they hand you that vaccine passport, every right that you have is transformed into a privilege contingent upon your obedience to arbitrary government dictates. It will make you a slave, unquote. <laughs> well, Griff, as we both know, Tucker Carlson is well known for having on very real Democrats who are definitely not leftist props for the right wing content creation mill. Yes, from Glenn Greenwald to Aaron Maté to Jill Stein to Tulsi Gabbard to Matt Taibbi to the Antifa professor guy to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Tucker is great at finding extremely honest brokers who claim to be on the left. If only those woke Antifa communist terrorists on the left hadn't gone so crazy, these people wouldn't have to go on Fox News to be heard. But alas... Honestly, honestly, the hardest part there was to stop naming. Yeah, we could do quote, this unquote, leftist. for a while. This is, uh, yeah, man, there's an industry here. It's amazing. It is. It is. And then there's good money in it. Mm -hmm. If if you don't value your soul. Mm -hmm. You got to figure out how to sleep at night. But, you know, you'll have at least a lot of money to buy sleeping pills. Then. <laughs> Lots of my pillows. So. Uh, <laughs> promo code post them. <laughs> Uh, but it's not just Tucker, though. RFK Jr. is a frequent guest on Steve Bannon's show. And if you're talking to Steve Bannon and telling him that, oh, no, you're not anti-vax. And actually, that's just a pejorative smear against anyone who challenges the pharmaceutical industry. Then you're probably anti-vax, even if you consistently deny that specific label, which is really all they're doing here. <laughs> right, right. Because they hate that label. They say they're not anti-vax. They're pro, quote, good vaccines or pro, quote, good science. But who gets to decide which vaccines are good and which aren't? Not the doctors. Why? Because they're supposedly in the pocket of big pharma. So who then? Random Twitter user with six digits in his handle? The QAnon influencers? They're always trying to chip away at the truth without sounding like complete lunatics. That's how they pull people into these movements, and doubt is extremely powerful for them. Of course, when this report came out tying RFK Jr. to Steve Bannon, Kennedy denied that Bannon had anything to do with his presidential run. I'm going to read it and you tell me what it sounds like. This is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on Twitter on April 8th, 2023. 
Is it a sign of my campaign strength that the elite of DC's establishment media simultaneously and shamelessly published an orchestrated and baseless lie to smear me even before I announced my presidential campaign? CBS News' is Bob Costa, The Washington Post, The Daily Beast, Vanity Fair, and Salon are circulating fake news that the American people have come to expect and despise. Steve Bannon has nothing to do with my presidential campaign. I have never discussed a presidential run with Mr. Bannon. Journalism should be about, quote, investigate and report, not, quote, invent and report. Ooh, sounds like the left-wing version of screaming fake news to me. Yeah, he got fake news in there, but he he did it, you know, with a with a smile and in a suit. He is a Kennedy after all. He's got that rhetorical <laughs> gift. <laughs> Ask not what your country can do for you. <laughs> Seriously. Ask what we can do to the fake news if you elect me president. <laughs> Well, let's not forget that RFK Jr. has appeared on Russia Today or RT. He wrote an op-ed for RT in late 2016. We know how frequently guys like Tucker and Steve Bannon are cheerleading for the Kremlin, but the Russians are more than happy to have this sort of rhetoric coming from so-called leftists. They know the best way to sow doubt and mistrust in our institutions is by coming at it from both sides. And the anti-vaccine rhetoric has been a feature of Kremlin disinformation campaigns for many years now. This long predates the COVID-19 vaccine. Here's Kira Butler from Mother Jones in March 2022. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've seen how conspiracy theories can overlap and collide. I've documented how anti-vaccine groups embraced QAnon disinformation about liberal elites conspiring to unseat Trump. And how white nationalists find willing audiences for their racist ideology in anti-mask groups. Over the last week, a new disinformation hybrid has appeared as online anti-vaccine groups have become a hotbed of pro-Russia conspiracy theories about the conflict in Ukraine, and some of the most prominent anti-vaccine activists are actively promoting geopolitical falsehoods. Imran Ahmed, executive director of the online extremism tracking group Center for Countering Digital Hate, has been following the convergence of the conspiracy theories, and he's noticed they share familiar themes, alleged secret government alliances, anti-Semitic accusations, and allusions to nefarious scientists. There are particular individuals within the anti-vaccine world who are amenable to pro-Russian propaganda, he says, and that would include some of the people who've cohered around QAnon and Trump. One example of this is how an old Trump-era storyline, the theory that SARS-CoV-2 was deliberately engineered in a lab and released, seems to have been reconstituted in a new form. Anti-vaccine influencers claim that the United States owns a network of secret biolabs in Ukraine where dangerous infectious disease research takes place. For them, it's just obvious that Biden is sending aid to Ukraine in order to protect those assets. This rumor has proven to be manifestly false, but that hasn't stopped it from circulating and gaining momentum. Imran Ahmed's team at the Center for Countering Digital Hate has also noted that a strong current of anti-Semitism runs through many of the Ukraine conspiracy theories in anti-vaccine chats. Sherry Tenpenny, the anti-vaccine activist who has claimed that COVID shots make people magnetic, Hmm. suggested in a post to more than 150,000 followers that Jews were using the Ukraine conflict to distract the world from a meeting in Europe about pandemic preparedness. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Uh-huh. She shared a post from an account called End Times News with a Z that used echo parentheses, a widely recognized symbol that anti-Semitic hate groups use to identify Jewish people. Quote, whilst everyone is distracted by the events in Ukraine, with brackets around it, the WHO, with brackets around it, is ramming through an international treaty on pandemic procedures, the Post said. Same tribe every time. Woo. Yeah. On the same day, in a separate Telegram post, Tenpenny claimed that the hacker group Anonymous, which has carried out recent cyber attacks against Russia is part of the Soros Klaus Schwab World Economic Forum puppet army. This refer <laughs> Yep. Yep. This refers to billionaire philanthropist George Soros and Klaus Schwab, who is the founder of the World Economic Forum that holds yearly economic symposiums in Davos, Switzerland, 
we, you know, to to just interject here, you and I have mm-hmm. both talked about this mm-hmm. and the whole Soros narrative and line has gotten a lot of play recently after Trump's indictment. Absolutely. Ben Dubo, a fellow of the Democratic Resilience Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis, has documented the spread of Russian disinformation during COVID. He notes that anti-Semitic tropes involving Hungarian-born Soros are a hallmark of Russian disinformation campaigns, largely because Soros has promoted democracy in, quote, what Russia considers its sphere of influence, says Dubo. Quote, he is very much an obsession of Russian leadership, unquote. Anti-vaccine groups have their own diabolical Soros myth. Many believe that he worked with Bill Gates to hide microchip tracking devices in the COVID vaccines. In a bizarre Telegram video on Tuesday, David Wolf, a wellness influencer, also connected the invasion of Ukraine to George Soros and Klaus Schwab. He then went on to speculate wildly about American politicians, children, and pedophilia in Ukraine. Quote, if you're convicted of pedophilia in Russia, you'll get chemically castrated. He's going to throw you out. He told his more than 100,000 followers, quote, how can... John Kerry's kid and Nancy Pelosi's kid and Biden's kid all be involved in the Ukraine. I'll tell you how it because that is the bed of corruption in Europe and in mid Asia. He goes on to say one aspect of Putin's rhetoric on the Ukraine invasion that the Western hegemony is trying to force progressive values on Ukraine will appeal to Americans steeped in far right conspiracy theories about the deep state and the villainous intentions of public health agency. Putin's message, Dubo notes, really does throw pretty naturally off a lot of the messaging they had to try and raise skepticism about vaccines, about the origins of COVID, about how generally you can't trust any member of the Western establishment. And back to our discussion here, when we talk about disinformation or propaganda streams crossing, this is exactly what we mean. And a guy like RFK Jr. is a perfect person to throw in the mix. For a long time, he was the co-host of a show called Ring of Fire with a guy named Mike Papantonio. Well, in late 2016, Papantonio launched a show called America's Lawyer on RT America. He continued to broadcast that show until February 2022, when he finally left the network after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Which was the absolute least he could do, of course. Mm -hmm. And... Another thing that that has come up a lot with RFK Jr. is conspiracy theories about the JFK assassination and to a lesser extent, his own father's assassination. But the the JFK assassination in particular has been an obsession of pro-Kremlin propagandists or the Kremlin itself. It is long been an obsession of Roger Stone, who as we noted earlier, was photographed with RFK Jr. in 2021 and a now deleted Instagram post. And there's a 2021 movie by Oliver Stone, which also re-examined the JFK assassination, which has been, again, another kind of obsession of Oliver Stone for quite a while. And his, you know, if you look at if you look at Oliver Stone's recent work, it's it's very much centered around pro Kremlin talking points. Mm-hmm. And his son actually works for RT and has for a number of years. Yeah, I, this this is a guy who's I don't know when or how he met a lot of these people, but he's running. He's been running in these circles for quite a while now. <laughs> And we want to be clear here that there's no evidence that RFK Jr. is acting on behalf of the Russian government or any of its proxies here. We're we're not alleging any sort of nefarious scheme or plan around this, but it's notable that pro-Kremlin media figures align with Kennedy's messaging. They consider this guy a friendly. Bannon, Tucker consider this guy a friendly. And yes, RFK Jr. has pushed some legitimate left-wing causes. His environmental work and the awareness he raised about climate change years ago was good and important work by many accounts. He was an assistant district attorney in New York City decades ago. There was a time when it seemed like he might run for political office in New York, either state attorney general or U.S. Senate. Neither one happened, but it wasn't an absurd idea at the time. But fast forward to 2017 and RFK Jr. meets with Donald Trump at the White House to discuss a position in the Trump administration. He comes out of this meeting and says that he had accepted a position to chair a, quote, vaccine safety 
Commission, which would investigate the debunked theory that vaccines cause autism. The commission never really materialized, probably because Trump staffers ultimately killed it. But still, there are a bunch of red flags here with RFK Jr., and they're not hard to find. Well, speaking of guys who like to stay on Tucker Carlson's good side, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signaled that he was working on a pardon for a convicted killer after Abbott was on the receiving end of some right-wing media vitriol. The most notable criticism came from Tucker Carlson himself, but the usual suspects got involved and demanded that Sergeant Daniel Perry be pardoned after his felony criminal conviction for killing a Black Lives Matter protester. Indeed, Kyle Rittenhouse, Mike Cernovic, Jack Posobiec, Greg Price, a long list of names in right-wing media demanded a pardon for Perry. And while Abbott refused to appear on Tucker's show to explain himself on Friday, the next day he put it out there publicly that he was working on a pardon. Let's read the Austin American Statesman's coverage of this story. Less than 24 hours after a jury in Austin found Daniel Perry guilty of shooting to death a protester, Governor Greg Abbott announced on social media on Saturday that he would pardon the convicted killer as soon as a request, quote, hits my desk, unquote. This unprecedented effort, which Abbott announced to his one million followers on Twitter, came as Abbott faced growing calls from national conservative figures such as Fox News host Tucker Carlson and Kyle Rittenhouse, who was acquitted in the shooting deaths of two Wisconsin protesters in 2020, to act urgently to undo the conviction. Here's Tucker Carlson. Because Austin, Texas, the justice system was overseen by a Soros-funded DA, Perry was charged with murder for defending himself. And tonight, we are sad to tell you, this man, a military veteran driving an Uber car, was convicted of murder. And what does that mean? It means that in the state of Texas, if you have the wrong politics, you're not allowed to defend yourself. So this is a legal atrocity. It's so obviously unjust that tonight we extended an invitation to the sitting governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, to come on this show on Monday. And we wanted to ask if he was considering a pardon for Daniel Perry. But for some reason, Governor Greg Abbott's office told us he just can't make it and that we should talk to the Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton, instead. So that is Greg Abbott's position. There is no right of self-defense in Texas. We're going to keep trying to reach the Governor of Texas, get his views on that, and the Attorney General for that matter. Quote, Texas has one of the strongest stand-your-ground laws of self-defense that cannot be nullified by a jury or a progressive district attorney, quote, Abbott said in a statement. I will work as swiftly as Texas law allows regarding the pardon of Sergeant Perry. This is really an unprecedented move in the history of Texas jurisprudence. It's the kind of thing that has left legal observers scratching their heads because this just isn't done in Texas. This is former Travis County Assistant District Attorney Rick Kofer on KXAN News, Austin. Getting a pardon from the governor is more rare than winning the lottery or being struck by lightning. Daniel Perry hasn't even been sentenced yet. He's not even at this moment eligible for a pardon from the governor. Even to apply for a pardon requires final certified copies of judgment and sentence. Abbott served on the Texas Supreme Court. He knows Texas law. He knows that what he has proposed to do today is inconsistent with the law. What you're seeing today is purely political theater, and it's sad. It really makes one wonder if Greg Abbott is running a very subtle shadow presidential campaign. That's what Brendan Steinhauser, chief strategy officer for Young Americans for Liberty, told Spectrum News. He said, quote, Governor Abbott can definitely be a viable candidate. He can raise a lot of money to compete. He can compete nationwide. I think the thing he's going to have to do this legislative session is tackle some big, bold issues and excite the base, kind of the grassroots of the party, to say, quote, I can be the person to carry the torch of liberty for you, unquote. And this is exactly the kind of move one would make if one wanted to excite the grassroots and the base of the party. Just saying. Yeah, well, he's uh, he's letting DeSantis take all of the early flack from Team Trump and Abbott's over there sitting back and doing a lot of the Trumpism without Trump things. And all this stuff adds up in the mind of GOP primary voters. And it's important for him that they're thinking about him, that they remember he exists. You have to uh, 
insert yourself into the conversation one way or another. And now he's going to come out this the good guy in their eyes. Mm hmm. You remember the immigrants to Martha's Vineyard fiasco on Ron DeSantis' part where he flew plane loads of migrants to Massachusetts in a very contrived media stunt? Well, Governor Abbott's been doing the same thing since last year, and he shipped thousands of migrants on Greyhound buses to New York City and D.C. In a statement last year, Abbott's office said Texas has bused more than 7,400 migrants to D.C. since last April and more than 1,500 migrants to New York City since August 5th. The busing mission is providing much needed relief to our overwhelmed border communities, the statement said. Operation Lone Star continues to fill the dangerous gaps left by the Biden administration's refusal to secure the border. And the base loves this kind of thing. They hate these people and they want to see them punished or, if nothing else, moved on in a way that really makes life hard for them. So hopefully they don't come back. Yeah. And Abbott's young enough or young enough by today's apparent political standards. He's what, 65? <laughs> yeah, 65 now. Uh, that's that's young. It's a spring chicken. Yeah. Um, Sad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he could he could still run in 2028 if circumstances don't work for him uh, this time around. But yeah, there's there is a, another shot in four years. And I'm not at all surprised by this, but it's it's just heinous because part of the reason the base loves this and loves the fact that Abbott is looking to pardon this convicted murderer is that it's a Black Lives Matter protester. Mm -hmm. and it's owning the libs for them it's owning the libs and if you look at this cbs austin report of this story and because the right is not going to talk about this i did want to read from this so the night that perry fatally shot garrett foster the victim in this case was july 25th 2020 and perry was in downtown Austin driving for Uber and he called 911 after the shooting. But they looked back at his social media post and this was presented in court. They say evidence presented in court shows a social media post made by Perry on May 31st, 2020 regarding the topic of killing protesters. He wrote, I might have to kill a few people on my way to work. They are rioting outside my apartment complex. <laughs> Sounds a little premeditated uh, there. Yeah. More messages were shown dated June 1st, 2020, pertaining to a YouTube video. Uh, protesters, looters get shot in San Antonio. Perry responded to this video with a mes message stating, glad someone finally did something. It definitely sounds like... This guy, I mean, and one of the other points that got made is that the protester was carrying an automatic rifle or something that looked like an automatic rifle. But this is Texas. Open carry is very much a part of Texas. This is a state, and I've seen this, where the daycare centers have signs on the door in Houston that say, don't bring your guns in here. Like, that, you have to remind somebody of that. Yeah. This is Texas. They are big on guns. Well, and, and the victim in this case, yeah, like you said, he was openly carrying an AK-47, but he was legally doing so. Mm -hmm. Do I think that's a terrible idea? Absolutely, I do. But Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, the fact is, though, it's his, it was the law. He was allowed to do this. The law should be different. And it's clear that regardless of all the posts and what was said and whatever was or was not going through his head, this was decided in a court of law and a jury of his peers of daniel perry's peers found him guilty of murder mm -hmm. they did not believe that it was a justified killing they did not believe that he acted in self-defense and the social media posts and statements that he had made helped solidify their case but at the end of the day the court decides whether you acted within the bounds of the law or not and he was found guilty and Greg Abbott has decided that that doesn't matter and that a jury of Daniel Perry's peers are less important than the whims of Tucker Carlson and an army of right wing shit posters who don't like black people, mm -hmm. who don't like anyone protesting for the rights of black people. And 
this is just an own for them. And it's heinous and it's terrible and it's fascism. It's it's wrong. It's outside of what should be legally possible in this country. This is not who we are and it should not be who we strive to be. No, not at all. But this is what happens when you try to play that game and try to appeal to these people. Yeah. The verdict of the jury is as follows. The verdict of the jury. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Perry, guilty of the offense of murder as alleged in count one of the indictments signed by the foreperson. Verdict form number two. Verdict of the jury. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Perry, not guilty of the offense of aggravated assault. The deadly weapon is alleged in count two of the indictment. Please be seated. Um, would either party like the jury to be polled? Juror number six, is that your verdict? Yes, it is. Juror number seven, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Juror number eight, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Juror number nine, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Juror number ten, is that your verdict? Thanks for listening to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can go to didnothingwrongpod.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at James, the word four, and the letter M, all one word, and Grizza BJJ, G R Z A BJJ, as well as DNW Pod. Thanks again for tuning in, and remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.